Stand by. It's the science of stupid. Warning! Many of the stunts contained in this program are the result of scientific ignorance. It's no excuse and can lead to serious bodily harm. Do not copy them. Yes, this is the show that beats the twin paths of science and stupidity. Over the next half hour, we will see what happens when those two paths collide. We celebrate off-piste investigations into inelastic collisions, expanding gases, Newton's first law, and angular momentum. Find out the hard way. If you try to break the laws of science, oh they'll break you. So people, remember, scientific ignorance can badly affect your judgment <laughs> and will not make you more popular. Now strap in for the science of stupid. On this show, we'll see what momentum can do to your golf swing, how Hooke's Law can affect your face, and what happens when you forget about interlocking stability. But first, this. Gymnastic bars. Dangerous enough in the gym, so why did they put them in public places like parks or beaches? It's great when there are gym bars at the beach. You can show off your six-pack and make a big impression with the ladies. He certainly made a big impression on the beach with his head. They may be simply constructed, but this kind of apparatus are especially unforgiving because they demand a high level of commitment and skill to master. Success at gym bars relies on gymnasts building up their momentum on the bar and using it to spin themselves through the air. Let's look closer. Two kinds of momentum are involved. Angular momentum keeps you rotating. Linear momentum determines your speed and direction of travel when you let go. Going from totally vertical above the bar to totally vertical below it, the force you experience is up to six times your body weight. So you do need a strong grip. Good rotation, plenty of angular momentum, and a strong double-handed grip here. He was OK until he tried a trick. With only one hand on the bar, his linear momentum sends him flying. Come on, people! Get a grip! Didn't we just say gymnasts experience forces of up to six times their own body weight? It's like being on a roller coaster. Scream if you want to go faster! He forgot to scream. Once you've mastered holding on, you need to know when to let go. In order to land the right way up, you need to build up enough angular momentum before you release and still have enough linear momentum to move away from the bar, which lets you land elegantly on your feet. Remember, it's all about timing. So where did he go wrong? He lets go too late, so his linear momentum is too vertical, meaning he's still too close to the bar. Even with two eager helpers standing by, his lack of angular momentum makes him land on his head. He's not going to win any medals with helpers like that. This guy's good. A pro gymnast can reach about 40 revolutions per minute. Impressive stuff. Oh. He tucks in after he leaves the bar, but opens out too early. So instead of landing elegantly on his feet, He's slammed down like a duck. A dead duck. You can say one thing about stilt design. It's come on in great strides. Sorry, sorry. We've come a long way from this. Whatever it is. 
Whether you use modern sprung stilts or wooden sticks, it's all about balance. When walking on stilts, you must keep yourself from tipping more than 15 degrees sideways. You want to keep your centre of mass above your base of support to stay upright as you move forward. Stilt walking is hard enough as it is, so there's really no need to overcomplicate it, like these people. He might need those crutches in a minute. Yeah. Walking backwards, he's put his bottom outside his base of support. And now it's all on the ground. A skateboard isn't a solid base. That's a case of a valuable lesson learned the hard way. On ice, there's less friction to grip the floor. You need solid ground to keep your balance. If you're bored with two planks of wood strapped to your legs, you might want to try spring stilts. None of that clumping around. Instead, a graceful stride with a spring in your step. Literally. Sprung stilts efficiently store and release energy to amplify your running speed. Double the downward force and you can double the compression of the spring. It's Hooke's law, and the more elastic potential energy that's in the spring, the more kinetic energy is released when the spring recoils. Has he put enough energy into his spring to jump the bike? Yeah, with that sense of timing, we'll never know. When running on spring stilts, extra speed means extra forward momentum. <laughs> Forward momentum and extra height makes you less stable. So even the slightest stumble pushes you straight into the ground. <laughs> did he mean to do that? Oh, I don't think he did. <laughs> this road is a good solid surface. With purposeful, confident strides, he loads energy into the springs. He keeps moving to maintain his balance. It's going well. But when he tips too far out of his base of support, <laughs> The released energy of those springs sends him flying for a rear-end shunt. Ow. Oh my God. <laughs> what scientific concept did this hard-working tow truck operator fail to consider? The scientific concept this hard-working tow truck operator failed to consider is tension. You have to be kidding me. The force created when one object pulls another. As the tow truck winches in the chain, tension pulls the car upright. The impact of the car landing detaches the chain and all the tension vanishes. Oh, and he should have put the handbrake on. Tiny David confronted the enormous giant Goliath with nothing but a simple sling. Its modern-day descendant, the slingshot, can be just as deadly, so don't fire them at inappropriate targets, like people's heads. He's taking very careful aim at entirely the wrong target. Understanding the power of the slingshot is the same as understanding springs. We need our old friend Hook's Law. Instead of compressing springs, this time we're stretching rubber. When elastic is stretched and made taut, it stores elastic potential energy. In physics, they define that stretching as work. Double your stretch and you quadruple the potential energy. As you let go, potential energy is transformed into kinetic energy.
And you thought it was just a stick with a piece of elastic attached to it. Well, well, it is. But those sticks can be big. Remember, when elastic stretches, it's storing energy. So the work he has put in has returned to hit him in the chest. The line between success and failure can be... Well, elastic. These guys are attached to a giant human slingshot. Energy from the quad bike is doing all the work. If these guys weren't strapped in, they'd go flying. But as they are strapped in, the kinetic energy is transferred back into the elastic and it rebounds them in the other direction at about 60 feet in 1.6 seconds. That's almost 25 miles per hour. I know! Who knew the potential fun of so much energy? Instead of flying off at an angle, this couple are going straight up. Potential energy is transformed into kinetic energy. Okay, all right, all right, okay. And all his excitement is transformed into passing out. <laughs> you fainted. Okay. This guy's stretching that elastic an awful long way, and it shoots from release to impact in just 60 milliseconds. <laughs> Which isn't great for the nipples. They say all work and no play makes you dull. They just need something to dull the pain. Yeah. Oh, look, they match. That is good. If you've done your sums correctly, you'll have exactly the right amount of potential energy stored in the elastic to convert into exactly the right amount of kinetic energy when released. Oh, no one likes to show off. Our ancestors knew a thing or two about building towers to last hundreds of years. The Eiffel Tower, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, many other towers. But what about a human tower? Not a monument for hundreds of years. More like a few days in hospital? OK, so the human body is not as strong as stone. Especially not mine. So it's really not advisable to try and build a human tower if you don't want to break any bones. One of the strongest shaped structures is a pyramid. Like bricks in a wall, the best way of stacking humans is to have each overlapping two people below, which distributes the weight across and down as evenly as possible, with the lightest people at the top and the strongest and heaviest at the bottom, holding the most weight. Some cultures around the world have time-honoured traditions of building human towers at festivals. Isn't that a beer festival? Instead of putting the strongest bodies in the base, those two big lads are on the top. The bricks of that tower aren't overlapping. And it's fallen over. Now that's what I call a tower. Watch out for the cables. This tower in Thailand goes up well. Heaviest at the bottom, lightest at the top. but with no layers overlapping to spread the load, it collapses vertically down. In Spain, this human tower is called a castel. It has a wide, strong base topped by a tall, narrow tower. Those layers aren't overlapping. Some of those poor hombres could have over a quarter of a ton of weight on their shoulders. No, not anymore. Oh, look, now it's more like a pyramid. Because they have a low centre of gravity, short, broad towers are more stable than tall, slender towers, which can collapse with just one small mistake. 
Now this tower looks stronger. Surely three people on each layer of the tower should be better than two to spread the load. No, they're still not overlapping. Reportedly, the highest human tower ever was over 40 feet high. That one's, well, maybe 25 feet. Oh no, now it's, now it's only 10 feet. Ole! I personally very much enjoy watching adults and children thrashing at small objects with pieces of metal. But don't worry. <laughs> yes, I'm talking about golf. A great golf swing relies on using the double pendulum effect. The first pendulum is from the shoulders to the wrists. The second pendulum is the hands and club. Together, this creates more acceleration in the club head. The faster your club head is going when it hits the ball, the more kinetic energy will be transferred and the further the ball will travel. I think my double pendulum needs more practice. He's very trusting. Does he know professional golfers can achieve a club head speed of over 120 miles an hour? I don't think he did. Momentum is transferred from the club into the object it strikes. The highest amount of energy transferred from a golfer's body to his club during the swing is five kilowatts. Some lawnmowers only need one. I don't know what they're doing, by the way, or why. Tiger Woods once hit a golf ball 498 yards. That's about 497 yards further than he's managed. <laughs> if the club doesn't hit the ball, all the momentum and energy is retained in the club. <laughs> that can't be a good idea. No solid stance. And if it hit the ball, he might have transferred some of that momentum onto it. Maybe he just needed a longer club. The best way to get good at sports is to start them early. Gives you time to improve. <laughs> Lesson one for the kids. If you swing twice as fast, you need four times more centripetal force to keep hold of your club. Less like a tee off, more like time for tea. When they grow tired of surfing the sidewalk, skateboarders often turn to grinding. It's not rude, it's just sliding the board along a rail. Of course, aiming high brings many skaters down low. Ow. If you're one of those people who think that low-slung pants are a sign of low achievement, then you are missing the fact that high-end skateboarding requires an instinctive grasp of classical mechanics, because skating is all about center of gravity and momentum, and low-slung pants. Here's how to grind with success. A clean landing with the board on the rails allows the skater to keep control of his body's position. The skater must lean back slightly to counteract the force of friction that tends to tip him forward off the board. For a good exit, he and the wheels should land in the direction of travel. Even if you don't know your board slide from your laser flip, I do, I do, I don't, you can admire the triumph of hope over experience of these hardy skate experimenters. This dude is trying a smith grind, or is it a 50-50? He's supposed to maintain perfect balance. It's called a 50-50 because it's meant to be on both trucks. Not because those are the chances of him smashing his face on the concrete. Oh, f I hit my head. You did? Yeah, I think my wrist is broken. Probably. Whoa. I know skaters are supposed to be laid back, but this guy's laid out cold. His center of gravity is just too far backwards. Longer board, specially built rail. This should be easier. Easier to bail. 
That'll teach him to keep his board beneath him. That looks like a cool rail to grind. But no trick is worth losing teeth over. He appears to have ground further on his bare skin than on the board. Don't try this at home, or you could be eating ice cream through a straw for weeks, which gets boring. Oh, dude, your whole face. It doesn't matter how high you rail or how low slung your pants. Misplace your center of gravity, and you end up with a bum deal. That was good. A perfectly balanced grind. Not happy to have done it just once, he's going for an encore. His velocity's right, his centre of gravity is in the right place, but his wheels haven't landed in the direction of travel. His second helping leaves him chewing concrete. Yes, we've made it through another cavalcade of catastrophe and cock-up. If, after all the pain and destruction you've witnessed, you're still contemplating similar stunts, think first about observing the laws of science, not the science of stupid. <laughs>